See, this is a workshop, meeting. not a meeting meeting. We, we, just, we just left executive session into regular session, right? So we have to open up the regular no, meeting. Am I, am I, we, no, we weren't going to the work session. session. When we go back into our regular meeting to close out our regular meeting, because we haven't done a lot of the director's report, our report, those kind of things. Yeah, that's we, I've already discussed that with Director Ricker. Welcome, sir. Hello, okay. Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Rich, uh, Richard Christensen, Curry County Roadmaster. I'm here today with our county contract engineer, Dyer Partnership, Mike Erickson, and Andrew Hall, who uh, per, uh, put the six-year facility plan together for us on our road infrastructure and to talk about that structure and other infrastructure and how we're going to pay for it and uh, chase uh, grant funding for projects. And we're going to talk about how this document's going to work and what the projects are and for you to have input on it. We have finished our uh, review of this and we're looking for your input as well. And uh, so this is going to be a two-part workshop. The first part is going to be going over this draft and answering any of your questions and explaining what we're using this tool for. And then the second part is that we want to do another facility plan, the stormwater facility plan, this fiscal year, in our, in our next fiscal year budget here. And uh, so and we would like to talk about that and how we want to move that forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Mike Erickson and uh, Andy Hall with Dyer. Yeah. Yes, you can. You probably want to adjust the mic there, too. Okay. Uh, I'm Mike Erickson, um, also the county surveyor here, so we're doing some interim uh, coverage of the uh, surveys that are going on in the county. Uh, this is Andy Hall, one of our uh, uh, PEs at the Professional Engineers at Dyer Partnership. So the uh, six-year capital improvement project sort of came about at the request of the road department and the intention was to provide a guidance over this next six years started in the current year we're in the 2021 and then carries on for a period of six years providing some overall guidance on the projects that uh, we think that are needed to occur and a, a prior to a ranking and so that was uh, development of the projects was based on uh, road department's uh, review, they have some analysis of road conditions and uh, based on their input as well as uh, our review of the conditions out there, we developed an overall uh, improvement plan. And uh, road department obviously has a, a sort of a pool of money that they use to uh, do the projects over the years and that fund is continuing to decrease in value. So um, one of the methods the county is used to sort of get the biggest project they can is they will try to get funding for certain projects and that allows that overall fund to continue to extend for a period of time. So this, this document was to try to uh, provide some guidance where you're sort of using that fund for the longest period you can. But obviously the uh, uh, the project, if you guys have had a chance to uh, uh, go in and delve with the uh, overall uh, improvements, um, we show uh, the fund starting around uh, the reserve fund around $18 million. Um, and uh, the end of the six years, that fund is down to about a little over $6 million. So obviously, um, you just can't continue to go down the road that way because you're going to run out of monies for doing those type of projects so eventually something's going to have to to give but right now the the guidance we were asked to is uh, develop a six-year project and uh, outline projects that are going to occur each year and possibility some of those projects do have some outside funding uh, primarily from the state um, and that helps uh, again placate the project the county need to do so that's just sort of a a summary. Um, what has been included in the uh, the CIP, obviously uh, you have, uh, we'll call them construction improvement projects. That's where you're improving the 
I'll say the road per se beyond what it currently exists. You have maintenance projects to where you're basically maintaining chip sealing. Um, that's more of a, I'll call it a preventive. You're not necessarily uh, adding a new improvement to the road per se. And then uh, there are also uh, guardrail is an item we show a funding in there each year because the, the guardrails uh, need to have a yearly maintenance uh, to get those brought up to speed. Um, the other element is the uh, storm drain element that we show some cost in there, but we don't really have a necessarily a good feel for the projects that need to uh, uh, take place yet. And that's one of the things that uh, the next workshop discusses the storm drain master plan. Um, is there any other items you think as far as? Well, part of that maintenance is also land acquisition. We had a few uh, properties that they can look at for clean uh, spoils disposal and whatnot. And uh, um, we went through each year and provide a pretty detailed layout of all the projects, um, studies that Richard's going to do with a like, chip sealing project, and budget that, and then um, we also have uh, unscheduled CIP projects that, you know, if, if funding allows, we'll be able to, or Richard will be able to look at projects, go from there, so. Some of the projects won't happen unless we receive a grant. Why don't you just take one of them off the mic stand and get to see your seat with idea. Some of the projects identified in this plan will, will not be completed if we are not successful with grants. And you know, part of having this facility plan, when we apply for grants, it raises our grant scores. It's a, it's a living document once it, the board adopts it. Okay. I guess I would, you know, it was sort of a workshop, so we're trying to see if there's some uh, uh, input that commissioners would have on that with what they're they're seeing on their side so we're trying to make this sort of the you know a guidance tool uh, for the county at least on the road department uh, the needs there and it serves as a good basis uh, I think this current year um, Richard said they're sort of ahead of the, uh, the funding is, is turning out better than what we're showing as far as what the reserve fund is being reduced by so that, that's a real good get so. Yes, at the time we started this plan, we had projected that we were going to use four million of road funds this fiscal year, and what we found out uh, was that we had a five million dollar rollover from the previous fiscal year, where we had only projected one point five million. And this is where that open gov I think is really going to help us be more seeing where our budgets lie in a more timely manner. So I'm really excited about that, but. You know, we had this huge windfall, I will call it, because, and then, you know, we've been working really efficiently and effectively and saving money as well. And so I kind of see where this start off of the road fund and this plan of being 18 million is really, you know, 22, 23 million. But we'll get that number before we bring this plan back to you to have it adopted. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm just, you know, Answering your question on a workshop, I'm one of those people that relies on the um, people that we hire and put into positions to do their jobs, and I fully trust our roadmaster to do his plan and and foresee what we're going to need over this next six years. So for me, I'm looking more for just a report of what you're going to look at exactly in storm drains, in roads, and chip seal, those kind of things and just your approximate, what you estimate a budget for that to be. Um, that's, that. that's more what I'm looking at. I mean, you, you know what we need in this county. I trust you for that. So um, all we need to know is the where's, the when's, and, the, and, the, and where's it going to come from, as far as I'm concerned, for this board. OK, would you like to go over each of the six years in this plan, which is the first year is the one we're working on and we're almost completed with. And you could see whether we did our what we said we were going to do or not. And then you could see what we plan for the next years, uh, provided some of these projects will be funded. 
or some of them may not because we don't want to pay full value. Our goal is to uh, obtain state and federal funding where we're paying 10% of project value. Mm -hmm. So if it's a million dollar project, we want to pay $100,000. And so, but if we don't get the grant, that project will not be done that fiscal year. It'll be pushed out till that grant is obtained. Okay. Before you go there, uh, Roadmaster Christensen, just give the public just a little more information on the windfall you just mentioned. I mean, that was that was obviously pretty good news for the road department and your and your management. Thank you. Well, basically, you know, I think. We all been running shorthanded and everything. And at the time when we were doing our budgets, the information I had from finance at the time was projecting X amount of dollars. And and when I budget revenue, I always budget conservatively, you know, because you know, I, I want to make sure that I don't come up short. And also too is when I budget, I, I budget. Uh, projects I look at you know the uh, what we think the actual cost is going to be and you know figure it kind of high and if we kind of and see you know we come in better so I try to budget that way so I I don't because we don't we're not dealing with solid numbers all the time and I think with this open gov it's going to help me have a better revenue forecast with rollover funds because uh, before the loss of timber funds, typically the road department had three, four million dollar a year rollover funds every year, and that wasn't the case here the last few years. And so this last year, uh, we were using numbers from not a completed fiscal year, but previous fiscal year budget, and we were guessing what that number was going to be. And I was guessing, you know, two million. And I put in 1.5 million. And then when I talked to Sino, when we did our mid-year budget review, she said, "Rich, it's five million." Okay, so I mean, that's what the windfall was. It wasn't. It was a budgeting error, if I had to say that. I, I think this board can I speak for you? Is pretty agreeing with Commissioner Pass. No one do flattery. To make we, more errors like that? No, no. We have a lot of confidence in the direction of the road department. Yeah, We've yeah, had yeah. three. Tremendously talented um, roadmasters in the last 30 years. Commissioner Pash? I just, for, for full transparency for the public and this board, um, a couple days ago we invited uh, the roadmaster and the sheriff's department to sit in on, on the new budgeting program on this open gov. And I think they were both really impressed. Uh, I know uh, McDonald said he was pretty impressed at how easy it went and how good it was. And I'm hearing Richard say the same thing. Thank you. So I, I guess, you know, and you feel comfortable just going through the six years of what the projects were and, and I can answer whether or not we did them, or at least the first year and what we're projecting out for the next. Yeah, we, we can go through those. Um, construction projects are projects that the county uh, hires out contractors to do. Uh, we had a few, they had a few FEMA projects, um, projects listed at Gardner Ridge Road. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you want me to go through costs or just... No, I'll just say the projects. Okay, Gardner Ridge Road. Uh, That's, um, will be completed here this month. So just wanted to let you know on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Langlois Mountain Road at mile post 5.7. That was also a FEMA project. Um, That's complete. Complete. Cedar Valley and McKinnon, uh, basically a big culvert project. That's complete. Um, non-emergency related but contracted uh, projects were Nicholson Drive, um, Azalea Lane. Yeah, all those were 2020 paving projects and they're all complete. Um, Morrill Bridge. Morrill Bridge has been uh, delayed due to permitting and environmental review with State Historic Preservation Office because we ran into uh, tribal artifacts. Morrill so Bridge is where? Morrow Bridge is nine miles up Flores Creek Road. Oh, okay. Wow. That's, That's the one I want on you, with you on that one? Yes. Okay. Um, paving projects, like overlay projects, uh, Cemetery Loop, um, Port Orford Loop, Zumwalt Lane, 
Cedar Valley Road. All those projects are complete. And not only that, as we reached out to Port Orford, if they wanted to piggyback, and we completed some of their projects as well. But they paid for them. We didn't make any money. And uh, so we completed all that work as well. And then uh, in the construction projects, we have striping. Uh, we do a couple miles of or 180 miles of striping that was completed. Um, we, storm drainage projects, we gave a kind of an overall just a number in the CIP to take care of those. I, yeah, we completed two storm drain projects, one to check a river head wall project for around $100,000, and then we did another storm drain project on the uh, neighborhood here just north of town, we about $30,000. And then you have, uh, each year we budgeted in the CIP guardrail replacement? Yeah, this year we weren't able to obtain it. Get in, we wanted to do $100,000 of work, but... Uh, today you approved nineteen thousand dollars of work, so we didn't meet our goal on that. But we plan on uh, the next four years or five years to meet that goal. Uh, now we go into the maintenance uh, category. Um, that's basically chip sealing, the county chip yeah. sealing. You, you guys, we have in the CIP report Cedar Valley Road, Hunter Creek Complex, Hunter Creek Loop, Hunter Creek Road. Mateer Road, North Bank Rogue River Road, and South Bank Chetco River Road? Yeah, all those projects were completed. And also we did, uh, I believe it was 12 miles of Carpenterville Road for the state. So we piggybacked with the state, and we didn't make any money on that project, but we didn't lose any money, and we were able to get additional revenue of, uh, I believe it was about $80,000 into our budget this year for that work. Chip seals are a little bit weather dependent. Usually right. you need, the, yeah. obviously, the warmer summer month just for that to work out. So usually you know, we're past that. So uh, most of the chip sales coming up in this next year will be after. Yeah, the yeah and, and our chip seals are superior chip seals from what I'm seeing that other counties are doing. And a lot of it has to do with the training, all the new equipment you've allowed the road department to buy these last three, three years, how we've changed our process, changed the oils, changed how we compact the rock. We put a steel drum roller on it. We put two heavy weight ballast pneumatic tire rollers on it. And we're super efficient and effective at it. And it's uh, last year our projects came in at $31,000 per mile versus doing an overlay that comes in at about $220,000 a mile that we have to contract out. So you were next there. Well, I just had a quick question on the storm drains. Is that the machine that you leased? No, that's the different machine that we're, we want to. I want to reach out to the board and try to buy next year. It's about but that's when I went on the on the uh, test with you down here on um, on uh, South Bank or. Yes, yeah, that's a, a, a vector truck vector for truck, jet yes. rotting and vacuuming out storm drain lines, and uh, we really want to add that to our fleet and. and we're documenting that as well because we think our costs are going to come down. I thought down. that was money well spent. I've never heard vacuuming out storm drain lines before. Oh, you ought to see this thing, Commissioner. <laughs> when it comes again, you got to go pretty watch cool. it. you got to go watch it. Yeah. It's, this this equipment amazing. is uh, a big 10-wheel chassis with a 10-yard hopper in the back with a huge 8-inch va vacuum hose with six in 600 feet of 1-inch high-pressure hose, jet rod hose, and... Basically, our current equipment is falling apart, and it's on trailers, and it's really small. Our vacuum has a three-inch or four-inch hose. Our jet rotter also has a one-inch hose, but it has um, doesn't have much capacity of water. And but basically, the the job site commissioner Pash is talking about our demonstration was we cleaned a a 36-inch line in like 20 minutes that would normally take us four days to do with our current equipment, and so. The thing is, is that we have, I think it's 37 miles of storm, or 33 miles of storm drain lines, and there's a lot of deferred maintenance in those lines. Can you can imagine how poor our equipment is now? So we need something like this so we could get our storm drains taken care of. But that's also going to be addressed in our equipment plan in this facility plan, but also in our next storm drain master plan that we're going to talk about next. Mr. Christensen, Commissioner Herzog's been waiting patiently. Patiently. So, Rich, when you were talking about 
the Carpenterville project, chip ceiling, we, you said we didn't make any money, didn't cost us any money, but we got $180,000. What, what does that mean? Well, it was 180,000. I believe it was more around 80, 85,000. Maybe I put 100 on there and I shouldn't have. Yeah, that's okay. I like that. <laughs> uh, more money is always better. Uh, basically, we're, uh, we're a nonprofit agency. We're not allowed to make money. And so when we work for a sister agency, we don't work the private sector. We just work with sister agencies in like the state or U.S. Forest Service or in the cities. And, um, uh, so basically, we can only recoup our actual equipment, labor, and material costs. And so when we work with the state, they paid for all the oil, they paid for all the rock, they piggybacked on our purchases, they paid those costs directly to the vendor. But then when we were done, we uh, kept track of all our hours of our equipment and our labor on the job site. And so that $85,000 was just paying the county back okay, I got for what okay. it costs us to help them. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Pash. No, I was done. Thanks. Okay. One thing I will Council do is out you know, on, on the chip sale. I don't want to uh, make him too big of an uh, uh, eagle there, but um, we, have, we, had one, on. we had one more question here. Oh, well, I let him finish, please. Okay. I was just going to mention, uh, I've driven on a number of chip sales that have been completed in other areas. And the one, a lot of the ones I see is the, you tend to get a fair amount of loose rock. And the derivative of that is the cracked windshields. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I have seen on his is I don't see near that amount of uh, loose rock. So uh, it sort of bodes well. If they, they're getting a good uh, sealing in there, and they're getting that compaction on the rock, and they're they know what they're doing. They got, they got a good crew. Yeah, the uh, you know, just to toot a horn a little bit more is the first year we changed our operations on how we did chip seal. We got a write up in a national magazine for the quality of our work on South mm -hmm. Bank Checo River Road. You were gone, and I and I read that article to the yeah. to the board. So, no, it's the, the training, the equipment, and and we're getting more efficient. We're getting more effective. The job. Quality is going way up. You know, the road department team is doing extremely well. It's that blonde-haired gal on that machine. <laughs> <laughs> yep. The, uh, <laughs> one thing I, I do see the uh, ODOT is in the past they just have more or less relied more on an ODOT or overlay type for a lot of the roads. Um, there is a fairly good trend in there going to a chip seal. Uh, I see them using more of that because it's a lot more cost effective. So a lot of the roads, um, if you can get in there and seal the surface and keep that uh, moisture from getting into the pavement, that's basically what destroys a lot of the integrity of the road is you're getting letting moisture get in the foundation. And so when you do a chip seal, it helps uh, minimize that. So it gives you a better lifetime. So. Um, Council Huddle? Oh, no, I'm sorry. They're still going. I'm just okay. listening. You want to go, where were we, heavy equipment? Uh, studies. So this fiscal year, the studies in the master plan are, uh, we haven't broken out, but the Curry County Storm Drain Drainage Plan and Harbor Hill Storm Drainage Plan, that'll be combined. Um, that's next That's next fiscal year. Going into the next. Okay. Yeah, this fiscal year was just this plan, I believe. Okay. Good. And then, um, so heavy equipment replacement. We've got the North Star Roadside Sprayer, uh, rubber tire excavator, and replace five yard uh, dump truck with that 12 yard dump truck. So we, we kind of changed that up a little bit because of shop uh, and equipment. We ended up buying uh, the rubber tire excavator that was in a d d dump truck and I'm having a brain blockage. I'm sorry. We bought okay. another piece of equipment instead of the North Star sprayer. We we delayed that purchase. That one that eats the trees? No, that's part of the uh, excavator. That's an attachment oh, for the okay. excavator. That's a Denise mulcher. It could grind a like a 20, 30 foot tall tree to the ground in seconds. And so, but that's that. part of that rubber tire excavator. No, yeah, that's the total road. It's yeah. Good. Um, so for that first the 2020 to 2021 uh, uh, fiscal year, 
Um, we're showing total uh, funds in there for 7.5 million. Um, the big uh, uh, element of that is more probably on the, uh, the Moral Bridge, and that Moral Bridge is going to carry over into the next fiscal year, uh, so that you'll have some carryover on that funding. Um, I'll let Andy step into the next fiscal year, which is the 2021-2022. Do you want to go over all those? Sure. Okay. So the payers projects, we've got um, construction projects. We've got Chapman Lane, Old County Road, uh, Woolham Road, Crestline Loop, Titus Lane. Lane, DeMoss Road. Galman Lane, and those are all projects. And there's three regions that they, these guys take care of, and that'd be the South Zone. Um, there's a bridge repair project in there at Etzene Bridge. Correct. We we applied for funding for three bridges this year through Dyer and our sub consult their sub consultant HDR for uh, STIP funds, and so we're not sure if that those are going to be approved or not so that it's an a bridge may not be um it's performed but that's the bridge on sixes river road where currently it's to one lane of traffic with a stop sign at each end and the traffic is limited to one lane of traffic yeah that's the highest rated bridge you have in there after the moral bridge so that's why we've got that in here trying to just because that lane restriction you're currently facing why we're trying to get that funded as soon as we can uh, overlay project, uh, West Hoffville Lane, Lively Lane, Stafford Road, Museum Road, Wilderness Road. So, yeah. So all those roads are our chip seal roads and our overlay roads. So those will be in next year's budget that I'll be bringing to you here in May. And then the remainder of the projects are just. Every year we have striping, storm drage projects, guardrail replacement, and tree removal just budgeted in there because you guys, that's maintenance you do every year. So. Yeah, next year is a pretty soft budget because we don't have all those big FEMA projects. And so it's going to be a smaller, it's going to be, no, we're going to be in more of normal maintenance and repair mode than we were this last year. Maintenance projects, chip seal projects that the county will be doing. Is uh, Old County Road, Woolham Road, Eitzen Drive, Kimlin Place, North Bank Chetco River Road, North Bank Pistol River Road, Pistol River Loop, South Bank Pistol River Road, and Airport Road. I mean, one of the items was land acquisition and that maintenance. One of them is the airport land acquisition. Right, and so that's the one I talked with you about a month or two ago about the road department would like to have use from the road department of that 34 acres that the county received in trade for the Flores Lake land swap and that's in this plan as well. So studies, going back to studies, the storm drain master plan. Uh, we had a question. I was just wondering uh, on the North Bank uh, Rogue Road, I thought there was supposed to be a culvert replaced on that this next year too. No, that was, uh, that's in this, that's, I don't I don't think that's in this plan. That'll be in our stormwater plan, and that was a project that we were teaming up with. Um, Go ahead, County Council. Council Hope. Oh, well, after you answer the question, I was just uh, trying to. Save my place in line. Yeah, the uh, Rogue Watershed Council, they reached out to us to put a fish pipe in on North Bank Rogue, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's called Ranch Creek. Ranch Creek, yeah. yeah. And uh, they, their funding uh, fell through. They weren't success, successful in their grant application. But knowing that, that they want to get it done, this next plan that we're going to talk to you after this plan, that'll be a project in there. So we keep chasing that. Okay, sorry. So go ahead, Council Huddle. Oh, thanks. So, Rich, you mentioned something about the funds and the Flores Lake land swap. 
Yes, and so um, before Julie Schmelzer left mm -hmm. is that I, I helped Julie with uh, vacating the county right away at Flores Lake that the county owned. And then uh, she put together a project with the state and the board to replay, to re exchange X amount of acres around Flores Lake to attach it to a state park for some other land they don't want that they weren't using. And so the county made that exchange, and I believe that process is complete. And uh, just recently. Right. And, and uh, so I've had my eyes on that 34 acres ever since I got wind of it. And I put it in this plan because the road department needs a place up north to, to stage all its uh, brush material for burn piles and all its uh, landslide debris and ditch debris because up north we have gorse and we cannot be trucking that stuff down here. And, and to truck it down here is major cost. So uh, that 34 acres on a major gorse road, there's gorse growing all around. And so we want to keep all that material up there. And this way we could uh, dispose of our uh, materials in a safe manner and, and, uh, and for the foreseeable future. So North County will keep our trucking costs down and will be and our disposal costs down. So, so, so the idea is that land has value and it's in kind of the county general fund that value and then you would exchange the value of that land for road fund to the county or something like that so that the road fund value is still the same and the county then has money it can use for other purposes from that land or that was the thought okay with uh, past operation Julie Smelzer that uh, whatever that value is we negotiate that right now the value of that land is two hundred thousand dollars well the timber we do not want to cut all the timber down it would look horrible along 101 corridor and we just want to uh, log a small portion in the center of it so we could take do our activities and so the thing is a lot of that $200,000 value is taking all the timber down we don't want to do that so the thought would be we'd find out what that value is to maybe it's a hundred thousand I don't know and then that money would go to the general fund for the commissioners to use as they see fit or the county and then the road department would have that piece of county land for its operations for the foreseeable future so we could have a place to dispose of our materials. Is there anything going on with the um, intersection at Wedderburn, uh, North Bank and 101 or the bridge, the north end of the bridge? Yes, that's the uh, Gold Beach Main Street project that Julie Schmelzer was a part of. And part of her vision was that uh, that 100,000 or whatever it was that uh, was decided to allow road department to have that 34 acres for their use Whoa. would go towards the Gold Beach Main Street project. That was her thought, and there's been a lot of talk about that, but I don't know if that's gathered any uh, support from the board yet. Yeah, I'm just wondering where that fits in. I, have you guys done work on that intersection? Yeah, we've done a, uh, uh, I'll say the preliminary design. We've submitted some plans to the road department for their input. Um, there was a pretty active uh, group in there driving that project, trying to beautify that location, make it a viewpoint, mm -hmm. and uh, thought it to sort of you enhance that. People are going to want to stop, pull off, and it sort of dominoes, and people want to stick around and do some things there they're seeing in the river there. So, yeah. Hold that thought. Commissioner Pash? Well, I was just, the, the acreage that uh, Roadmaster uh, is talking about in, in Port Orford, we discussed that at a meeting a month or so ago, I think we discussed the possible trade for that, uh, and I thought we kind of had or, you know, already chewed on that pretty good, and I don't want to say agreed to, but we're in, in we're in alignment with the road department to consider that. So, no, uh, that's going to be a hard sell to the public. <laughs> so I would need more information on it. I do want to come back to the triangle though, just to understand, because uh, I heard there was. And you could help me on this, but there was twenty thousand on the triangle that was spent out of COVID money. I don't know if that's accurate. I couldn't. I haven't had a chance to trace that yet. Towards uh, putting that, a potential plan together. Yeah, it was Ju uh, Julie Spencer's project, and she'd asked me if I would help with it and and help. And if they got the ground, that I'd help deliver the project. I said absolutely, I help. I think it's a a benefit to the community, and you know, it's the type of things that City of Brookings would have done and uh, with downtown beautification and get 
draw people to you stay in your community and spend money at hotels, restaurants, maybe go with the guide fishing. And so I, I volunteered. And so I met with a couple of people from Gold Beach, Main Street, and Julie and Dyer to, for their conceptual idea. And then I believe uh, there was CARES Act funding that would uh, pay for the engineering of the project. And we're still in that engineering phase. And that funding has, uh, engineering has been paid in full already by the CARES Act, I believe. And Do you so, know the amount on that? I, I want to say it's 23,000. That, that sounds pretty close, sure. And I saw some very good drawings and uh, absolutely impressive. Um, but, you know, when it kind of is, so the road fund, the road department does not have any funds uh, contributed to that yet. We're Zero. In that. Okay. Zero. Great. I just volunteered my time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so back to the, uh, what I call the, the Pacific High uh, West Acres, 33 acres. Uh, you said 200,000. I, I just, uh, the board didn't have agreement on it necessarily. They didn't have disagreement either. Um, because of the 101 access, you know, I put a pretty good value on that. Uh, of course, being close to the high school, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest. Let me, let me rephrase that. There is some interest in having a bike uh, to park there, a trail of, you know, camping facilities. That is a beautiful, at least on the north side, is a beautiful piece of property. And I've been through it a little bit, um, you know, and yeah, there's some big trees on that. And so, I, you know, I'm not thrilled with, right. you know, I, think I, I, I did communicate that a month ago when we had a meeting. I, I don't want to be, a, uh, I don't want to say no. Yeah, no, I think that's a good vision. And so I think that maybe there's enough acreage there to meet both our visions. And, and you took the words right out of my mouth. And so, I, and if, but you were going to do some potential burning there. You're right. At least and, in the wintertime. And, and we typically would, the plan, if we were to acquire there, we would burn there. We would burn there in the, you know, uh, after the rain started in the fall, maybe late spring, depending on how much debris we had. We would try to do it when school was out, you know, maybe Christmas break or something like that. And, and we tend to burn pretty effectively with blowers and managing our pile so we don't have a lot of smoke. But, yeah, we that's what we would try to do. And I, I like the bike ride idea. You know, I wouldn't want to squash that. I kind of look at that. When you did mention just a minute ago, and you mentioned it before, that, you know, you, you didn't want to harvest that timber right along the edge of the road and no. just down and across, as you know, that's a, you know, that, that was... That was timber time. I'm, I'm anything but anti-logging, but in right. that particular case, it really made an eyesore. So I, I know you're aware of that and sensitive to it. Uh, but it's, it's really neat to hear you say that yeah. there might be a possible way of developing both, because 33 acres is a good chunk of ground. So. Well, well, you got to also realize, and it's in this plan here, it's the Oregon Coast bike route. So I put in this plan, because we have county roads that are identified as uh, Oregon being on the Oregon Coast bike route. So I'd like to see those roads upgraded to be a bike route. And I have them in this plan so if there becomes money available from the federal government to upgrade those roads and fill the ditches in, put storm drain pipes, and put multi-use path in, this covers that. And so I'm all about that. So when I look at the Patterson viewpoint that Julie Smelzer was looking at, I reached out to the Oregon Coast Bike Route route if they were interested in maybe putting a bike kiosk there, if they wanted to, if there's some grant funding that they could contribute for that. So that's how all this stuff works. And so Oregon Coast bike route to me is very important because there's a lot of folks that bike Oregon Coast, and they have money. They stop at our restaurants, they stop at our hotels and, and campgrounds and whatever. And so I think that's all part of that engine it's, of getting money to Curry County. It's, it's a long-term visitor promotion you know, effort, and so, uh, but there, there should be a long-term benefit to the county there in, in revenue, you know, annual revenue. So, I, and I, th I think we're all thinking along the same lines, uh, how, to pl how to put that together and maybe do a combination. So, Commissioner Herzog? So that, you know, on Airport Road, you got, there's property on both sides of the road, right? Right. Seven and... So we'll take the south half, the big piece, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the bike campground could have the Excuse north Excuse me, part. I did have that backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so how, but how much land do we have on Air, on uh, County Shop Road? Oh, that's just a small shop, and, and we don't have much. And okay. there's a big building in there, and it's definitely not enough to stockpile uh, slide material. Okay. And we do have a small burn pile there, but it's all we can do to fit it in there. 
Yeah, you have quite a bit of, uh, you know, we, in this document, we, we show where the active uh, slip zones are on the county roads. Um, and up there on that north end there on the sixes, uh, that has a lot of uh, slides in it. So having a disposal area there on the north side is a sort of a critical path for that. But we also there. have some wetlands in there, don't we? Yes, and those wetlands won't, uh, I've worked with planning on this, and I really looked into this, and those wetlands, we, we would not touch those wetlands at all. And so a lot of that land is not usable, okay? And so, and, but we don't need all 34 acres to do what I'm talking about, and we want to maintain the scenic corridor. We want to kind of keep a low profile in there. We want to have a, a site that's approved by FEMA and DEQ, so when we have a big emergency project going up north, we have a place to move our stuff, and it meets all the guidelines, so we can get reimbursement for our costs and time, and let, you know, for uh, from FEMA, if possible. So, we're looking at sites throughout the county for this because we don't have any. So, you know, this is just the north site we're looking at, and there's sites central and and south and and looking east. And so, this is just one of a few more that we're trying to obtain. So, thanks for that extra time. Go through your studies. So uh, I mentioned the storm drain master plan, um, tower facility plan, and a heavy equipment plan. Tower facility plan. You want to touch base on that? As far yeah, as tower facility plan. What I was really looking for was OEM grant funding for that seventy thousand, not for the road department uh, to fund that. But the towers is a big drain on the road fund and towers are highly fundable and it distressed me to hear that Jeremy Dumar uh, resigned or left us because he was going to work on obtaining the, the grant funding for me or for that this next year through the Office of Emergency Management and so he's no longer here to help me with that grant funding but you know, we'll have to really talk and look about that because the tower facility plan is very important or, or you know all about our towers and all the problems and Towers are not the road department's expertise, and I need this plan to come up with a long-term plan on up and replacing the, those facilities and upgrading them as needed. So, but that plan is seventy thousand dollars, and uh, in having that plan, if we reach out to OEM for grant funding and we have a plan that's adopted by the board, that helps raise our grant score. So it's all part of that same process that we're trying to do for roads and storm drains and bridges and, you know, the guardrails in here. You know, all these things there's potential grant funding for. Um, heavy equipment, you have the cat front loader, low boy, low boy tra trailer, dump truck with snow plow and sander, and uh, I believe the new backer truck. Right, and the new Vector truck is going to be in the plan, and I know that's going to be a heavy pull, but I think we'll have the documentation to help support that. Expanded yeah, truck. truck. Similar to Seymour's type? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. really good trucks. Yeah. No, I mean, we still want to have, we have 33.5 miles of storm drains, I believe it is. It's to not have a piece of equipment that's efficient and effective to clean those types of pipes. That's unheard of for an agency our size. So um, I'd like to get to where we could uh, be proactive on cleaning our pipes and not reactive because historically uh, we have a lot of deferred maintenance and we're reactive. We wait till something goes wrong. And, you know, that those kind of times is when you could lose a road, you could flood someone's property type thing. And I want to be proactive and have these things cleaned ahead of time at a low uh, cost. But it's a high cost up front to buy the equipment. Yeah, those actor trucks just you know, a little bit of past history in uh, the city of Brookings. They had a sinkhole right, right outside of the city hall there. Mm -hmm. That was on a fairly good size. Of, I think it was a 30 inch concrete culvert. That sinkhole happened, all that debris got pulled into the existing pipe system. And just because of the the length and uh, the depth involved in the city's regular actor truck, they didn't have the means to deal with it, so they were limping by on that existing system. They had to bring in a uh, outfit out of uh, Portland, Seymour, that had those type of vector trucks that Richard's talking about, and that 
went through and uh, it took them uh, what, a couple months to clean out yeah that, it was thousands sort of and thousands and thousands of dollars because that was a big huge sinkhole of the city hall parking lot i was working for the city at that time and it was pretty horrible <laughs> and so the type of truck i'm talking about can move two foot boulders in a storm drain pipe it goes through a lot of water but we have a big tanker tender but also too at that time it's the city was in town so there was fire hydrants we had the trucks hooked up full time to fire hydrants and as fast as they could push the water out the hydrants were filling them up but we were cleaning pipes up to five feet in diameter that were halfway full of rocks and boulders and logs and all kinds of junk commissioner Pash, to, to help you understand what this thing is it's a jet engine <laughs> with, a, with a fire hydrant hook to it <laughs> with a hose with a, with a spray nozzle it's it's uh it's very impressive equipment so this year you've allowed me to rent two one from camel one from vector vacon is going to come in here with their truck it's just a demo here we're trying for next month Mention it. and Mention uh so we're demoing the three pieces of equipment to okay. see which equipment the team likes the best and once we determine what that is we'll build the spec around that and uh and bring that to you in our may budget Uh, just to mention, uh, 2020, 2021 was 7.5 million. Um, 2021, 2022, we had $4 million worth of county road fund projects. Uh, fiscal year 2022, 2023, um, it's kind of a lighter year for a lot of projects, but a lot of big projects are going to happen, and a lot of staff is going to be on these projects. So you got the Agnes Elahi Road, um, Jerry's Flat Road, which is a $3.1 million project. The county has $2.8 million in external funds for this one. Um, North Bank Rogue River Road, and then of course our striping storm drain projects, guardrail replacement and tree removal. Yep. We're showing on the storm drain in this study the duration of about six years, showing 400000 each year for storm drain projects. So obviously this last year probably wasn't as much expended uh, outside of that. No, no, there wasn't. going to vary a little bit. And those projects haven't been identified yet either. And those are, that's going to be in the next, they'll be identified in the next plan. And, you know, one of the things is that what this plan does is it spreads the wealth throughout the county. It doesn't like say like hey richard lives in in brookings and john lives in brookings we're gonna spend all the money down there you know we we every year we move that same amount of money to port orford north county central county here in gold beach agnes and and, and south county so we don't do two years in a row in south county we go to you know south county but back up north and then central and just kind of going throughout the county and it's spreading the wealth and making sure all the roads are kept in, in, in fair or good condition is the goal. And you know, we do have some roads that are in poor condition and uh, or in the lower ranges of fair that, you know, we're trying, if we can maintain our roads in fair condition and then do a chip seal and bring them up to good, that's what we want to do. And we don't want to get, you know, we have $500 million worth of infrastructure out there. And if we just did nothing, just let them totally Fall in disrepair, it would cost $500 million to place our 225 miles of roads. But we can maintain them. It costs, historically, the road department about six to six and a half million dollars a year to maintain our roads in a fair or good condition. That's where we want to stay. Because if we start getting into poor condition, the cost goes up. Now you're not talking about putting a chip seal on it. You might have to grind out the whole road. You might have to, like, not even take the road out. You might have to take the road base out. And, you know, you're getting into real money. And so we want to stay, keep our roads in fair to good condition through maintenance, which chip seal, we, like I said, we could do for $31,000 a mile versus an overlay, we, you know, 220000 a mile. But overlays last 20, 25 years. Chip seals last, if you're doing really good, like 10 years. But if I'm doing five times five miles of chip seal for every one mile of company cost for the county to do an overlay, you know, that's money in the bank. And so we want to try to get to where we're in a chip seal mode with our good equipment doing high quality chip seals 
and keeping our costs down and keeping our roads in good to fair condition, I mean, fair to good condition. Okay. Um, the remainder of the maintenance projects include Agnes, Elahi Road, a um, portion of that, Cougar Lane, Oak Flat Road, and uh, Bear Camp Road, which um, you'll work with the Forest Service yeah. on that one. U.S. Forest Service reached out to us to uh, Chip Seal Bear Camp Road, so we're looking at that. So that's in the plan for two years from now to uh, perform that work. And so we haven't put it together, but it's in the plan. Um, heavy equipment replacement costs for or projects. This one's project. Is replaced 2018 Chevy three quarter ton double cab with the four by four one ton four by four long bed crew cab and lift gate, um, a roadside spray truck, yep. uh, Cat 926 loader with diamond mower, uh, replaced 550 rock run truck with TI system and rock plow, yep. um, and replaced 8,000 gallon road oil tank. Right, and so, so basically how we're buying all this equipment you know, we're, 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 we're shooting for like $600,000, $800,000 a year in equipment purchases. Yeah. And yeah. we're not spending any more money than we normally did. And that's, like I told you, six to six and a half million a year budget. If we're not doing FEMA projects or other emergencies. Our budget is six to six and a half million. And our capital improvement, you know, we try to keep around two, 2.3 million. And so what I did to help buy this equipment is I... I said, okay, instead of us paying $1.2 million a year for doing chip seals, we're going to only do five, dollars $600,000 a year chip seals. We're going to take that other money and buy equipment. And the reason why that is so important is that our equipment, when it gets old and you're breaking down in the county, it causes us to be not efficient and effective. But not only that is, there's, what's happening is, what, and California is going to come to us, is these older generation diesel equipment and motors you're not going to be allowed to use them anymore. So then when you try to sell them at that point, they're not going to be worth nothing. Right now, in Oregon, that's not the case. And I can still sell these vehicles, like these dump trucks with these older diesel motors, and I need to get these new generation diesels in there so that in the future I can still, we can still do business. Currently, one of our operators that came to work for us a couple of years ago, Ray Berkey, came from Siskiyou County. They had a 10-wheel truck. It could only go 300 miles a month for California law because it wasn't the new emissions. And we do 300 miles in a day. You know, imagine not having a 10-wheeler sitting there for the rest of the month after a day of use. I can't do business that way. So part of this is, is renewing our fleet as soon as we can and being really aggressive about it. And we're doing less overlays. But So I'm taking that. But what we did is we bumped up our chip seals from like 8 miles a year to like 20 miles a year. So we're like doubling up on our chip to take care of those overlays that we're not doing, keeping our roads in fair to good condition. So not just reutilizing the money a little bit differently, still the same amount of money. And uh, so that's how we're doing it. And then 2022, 2023, I have uh, six and a half million of total county road funds. Big part of that is again that Jerry's flat road, but that was being funded by the state. Yeah. Good. Uh, Gentlemen, we're going to take a break about 15 minutes, just uh, not rushing you, but just to give you a little heads up there. Okay. Uh, 2023 2024. Um, we have Langlois Mountain Road, Hensley Hill Road. These are all construction projects. Knapp Road. Mackenzie Road, Stone Cipher Road, and Forest Creek Road. And these were all projects that were fair and below as rated by the county. Uh, we drove these projects and evaluated them and came up with project costs for Richard. Um, and then the county overlay projects for that fiscal year is Arizona Street, Paradise Point Road, Lakes End Road, I Street, and of course, our striping, storm drain products, guardrail replacement, tree removal budget. So it's pretty much the same thing right. every year. You know, we're spreading the wealth throughout the county, and we're we're sticking to that six and six 
half million dollar budget unless we get grants and uh, well we're looking at getting those grants the budget will go way up and a lot of that will be money coming in not money we're paying out because we're getting the grants at 10 percent of project value if things go well uh, Chip Hill projects included Langlois Mountain Road, McKenzie Road, Flores Creek Road, Noble Drive, Childers Road, Cope Loop, Flores Lake Loop, Lakeshore Drive, Hager Road, Flores Lake Road, Boyce Cope Road, Woodruff Lane, and Sixes River Road, and Grassy Knob Road. So that's a lot of projects for that here for the county. Yes. You can delete that Grassy Knob. It, it doesn't need to be fixed. I live on a grassy knob. <laughs> <laughs> Studies for that fiscal year are the bridge resiliency plan <laughs> and a transportation TSP master plan. Yeah. Well, the actual the TSP is was funded by the state, so actually that's going to be next year. It's supposed okay. to kick off any time, and I volunteered for that. And okay. Becky and planning department is going to help. So that plan is going to be fully funded, but it's going to be a lot of legwork on our end. The bridge resiliency plan, we have that contingent on funding. Well. Yeah, that's contingent on funding. Yep. Uh, heavy equipment replacement for that year is replace low, low boy tractor, rock run truck with rock plow, replace belly jump truck, uh, two of them. Uh, replace 2019 Dodge 4x4 quad cabs, shop service trucks, and a storm line TV camera system. Right. Uh, total cost for that year, 3.68 in uh, total county road fund. Do you want me to keep going? No, I think, I think we're beating it to death. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing I'll skip to the back. There are, we've identified 12 bridges that are uh, considered uh, 50 score and below, which mm -hmm. is, the structural oh, deficiency structural is a big deficiency. part of it. Yeah. And they're a huge cost, so they're all pretty much dependent on funding. Just one of them is like a $11 million bridge. And so without funding, there's no way we can do that. Yeah. If we receive funding, it would be $110,000, basically. And that, uh, or a $1.1 $1 million, excuse me, if we could, uh, and we might be able to afford that. but. You know, we'll look at that when it comes, the road fund goes down, you know, we're going to have to look where we're going to cut. And so, you know, there might be bridges we might want to cut. And, and because these bridges are looped, you could get to that bridge from either direction. It's not on a, a road where that's the only way to get there. You know, we might look at that bridge and say, you know what, we're going to block that bridge off. It's not a through road anymore. Put a turnaround at either end of it. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the money. You know, at, at a certain point, you know, the road revenues are not going up. They're going down. Right, and as we lose the road fund, they're going to be going down. At some point, we're going to have to say, "Well, how are we going to do business, and how are we going to maintain an effective working team, and keeping our roads the best condition that we possibly can with the money that we have?" And we're not there yet. I kind of see that in the next plan. When five years from now, we're going to be having those really hard discussions. But this plan is pretty much keeping business going as it always has with. The, like a $6.5 million a year budget, unless there's some catastrophe that happens, which could happen. You know, we want to maintain a road fund for those catastrophes. And so, um, but right now this plan is just basically saying we're maintaining business as normal for the next, well, this five years, because we did this year. And, uh, and in, you know, so in five years, we're going to have to have this discussion, because this has come up to be a budget committee uh, committee meetings in the past where the committee members go, well, what, what is the road department going to do when you don't have any money? You know, that question is asked to me a lot. We're not there yet, but we need to be thinking that direction because unless we were able to find a, a revenue source to fill that missing gap of three to four million dollars a year of forest revenues that we used to receive, um, we're not going to be able to maintain that level of service that we historically have. Okay. Yeah, for example, like we started out with the reserve fund uh, this fiscal year of say $20 million. 
uh, the end of the plan at 2025, 2026 is $6.5 million. So it's a big cut in your reserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your roads up to good condition. And that doesn't take in consideration all the storm drains that are going to be coming in this next plan. Yeah. So it's an eye opener. All right. Good time for a break, huh? <laughs> uh, are you done? You're not done, though. I think we're done with this first okay. plan. Yeah, Say that again, please, Richard. I think we're done with this first plan review for the roads. Okay. So this how much plan, more time do you need, roughly? Well, I, I think all I'd like to say in closing out this, what we talked about this road facility plan is this is what I'm going to be bringing to you for adoption at the next board meeting. And so if there's any questions or anything you see that you go, Rich, you know what, you know, we, we think differently or whatever, this needs to be a higher priority, or you, hey, you know what, you missed this project, you know, please let us know. Okay. And, you know, we got a couple of weeks till our next meeting to uh, make those adjustments. And so what I'm hoping to do is get this plan adopted in two weeks. And then also uh, the next plan we're going to talk about is that you approve that task order to get the next master plan done for the storm drain system. So you said get it hopefully approved in two weeks. Did you meet? We, coincidentally, we have a meeting on the 24th. Uh, is you're probably going to put that on the agenda, I presume. Yes. Okay. Great. We we had to skip one week uh, just normally on the second Wednesday, so just to give you a little heads up there. So here's my schedule situation. I need to be. This will sound a little puffy, but I need to be on the call to the governor's office just 15, maybe 20 minutes max. So if I could be excused without disrupting the people you have here, and vice chair can take over, and I'll get back as quick as I can. But I, I I'm going to ask you to go ahead and start. Uh, the plan until 3, take advantage of the time we have, excuse me, until 3.30, it is, oh, it's 3.24 now, so, yeah, you could start for a few minutes and then I'll sneak out and, and uh, you can, we can break for staff Jesuit at maybe 3.45, something like that. How long is the presentation going to take, you think? Um, it's just going to be a general overview of what the, we're seeing uh, is going to be driving the uh, needs for the Storm Rain Master Plan. So. 15 minutes, 30 minutes? Yeah, 15. Okay. So we just come back at 345. Yeah. How's that? Okay, well, just so you know, for housekeeping, we've got to go back into executive session because we didn't do 10A. Yeah. And we've so got to three, deal with that. So 345 might yeah. be 415, yeah. you're thinking, 30 minutes? Yeah. Okay. It, just, it, should, be, it should go quicker. Okay. I'll see everybody back here at 345. Fifteen at three forty-five, and uh, Rich, you're up. The pressure's on. Microphones, okay. Good. Yep. Yeah. Hello, commissioners. Hello. Fancy meeting you here. Yes. Well, this next plan is our stormwater uh, drain master plan, and this covers. Uh, our 3,500 culverts that we have throughout the county that are owned and maintained by the county. And I believe it's uh, about 33 miles of pipes that we have. And this plan is going to talk about those. And I talked a little bit about it the last one with the deferred maintenance and getting some equipment. But um, we do have some interagency projects like with Rogue Watershed Council. But there's many of our culverts that I know you talk about gravel all the time at the ports and everything. Well, that same problem is just with our storm drains, especially our larger ones, that the uh, stream bed has come up so high that our pipes are totally full of gravel. and they, they, They're uh, very uh, hard to maintain because there's a lot of rules with National Marine uh, Fishery Services and ODFW because we're in critical salmon habitat. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that and the cost of these plans. And what we're really looking at, at first we were looking at having uh, uh, two plans. One was the Harbor Hills and uh, Bench plan that incorporated the Port of Brookings Harbor because there's many deficiencies there. And there was a, another plan that was just that that was completed years ago for the county and city of Brookings. But what we're really looking now is just having an overall 
arching plan. There uh, will be a north plan, a central plan, and a south plan in our three zones, and we'll incorporate that harbor bench plan into the south plan with all those deficiencies. And so I think I'll, I'll just turn it over to Dyer and kind of talk about what we're going to do and the cost. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Um, so he sort of explained the uh, um, overall uh, view of the master plan breaking it into the, the three regions, which is the same way we did the uh, road uh, capital improvement project. So you got north zone, central zone, south zone. So we'd utilize that same uh, format with this. Um, Usually on the storm drain master plan, uh, when you're evaluating the existing uh, culverts, storm drain pipe, uh, you have a design storm that uh, you're using as a basis. Um, typically in municipal uh, type work, we use a 25-year storm. That's also what the county has for theirs. Um, one item we have suggested on some of your uh, arterial roads, um, which are a little more uh, key to the area, um, you may want to consider a 50-year storm. Currently, Highway 101 ODOT uses a 50-year storm in evaluating their uh, uh, culverts and pipes. So we think that might be prudent on a handful of these projects for the county. Basically, that just uh, get a increase your flows a little bit for a design storm. Um, as Richard said, you got 3,500 culverts. Uh, and an analysis that uh, we do for a storm drain system, we break out a drainage basin, and that basin is what flows into that particular pipe. Um, to try to evaluate 3,500 basins, that would be a little bit too cumbersome for what we're uh, showing. Um, so what we've done is we've sort of narrowed that down, anticipating we're going to evaluate 500 basins. Um, and part of that will be based on uh, the road department. They have a good feel for where they have uh, trouble spots, where they're experiencing overflows or uh, other deficiencies. So we would include that in the uh, sort of the basis for which ones we're going to analyze. Um, each analyzation you're going through and developing uh, uh, flows for that particular uh, basin and then based on the size of that existing pipe or culvert, um, you can determine what that pipe will take. Uh, obviously, if it's overflowing, um, it's going to show it's going to be undersized. So the recommendation would come in through with uh, what that pipe needs to be, and then we'll develop costs for uh, replacing those pipes. Um, the costs are, uh, can be a little bit of a tiered system because where you have pipes that you have fish issues with, right. your permitting process really uh, uh, becomes quite cumbersome. Um, you got ODF and W, uh, DEQ, um, and then uh, as we sort of uh, ran into on the uh, Cedar Creek culvert, you had an existing 60-inch pipe that uh, needed to be replaced. We were anticipating bringing in a uh, seven-foot pipe just based on what was recently done upstream. Uh, when we got into the permitting to get it from the uh, ODF and W, they did an analysis and said it needs to be a 12-foot pipe. Mm -hmm. That increased the cost uh, considerably. Uh, and then after ODF and W did their analysis, National Marine Fisheries came in and said it needs to be one and a half times that. So it changed originally from a six foot pipe to ODF and W saying 12 foot. Now NIMPS saying it needs to be 18 feet. So wow. um, those type of issues can really uh, snowball your costs. So that's going to be one thing on uh, any of these culverts where we have the fish bearing streams, um, those costs, you're probably going to see that they're going to be uh, probably significantly higher just because of that uh, potential. Um, study parameters, um, what we have done and the number of the other storm rain master plans we've completed, uh, we typically break it out into seven uh, chapters. First chapter is mainly an introduction. Second chapter is uh, goes over the study area. 
um, includes the topography, type of soils, the flooding hazards. Third chapter, um, that's a more detailed one that uh, gives an overview of the existing system. Um, one thing the county has here, they have a, a pretty good uh, GIS database um, and uh, they've also done an analysis and they keep that current with the existing culverts as far as how they're rating them, uh, whether it's good, fair, poor. And that'll come into play as far as which ones we're going to concentrate on the uh, uh, doing the analysis. The fourth chapter um, is where we get into the planning criteria. That includes the uh, federal and state regulations pertaining to the stormwater systems. Uh, we also touch base on the local ordinances. And uh, in this particular case, we've had some discussion with Richard. Um, the county has uh, some ordinance, but um, he would like to have some additional ordinances uh, developed as part of this plan, uh, just to give the county uh, maybe a little bit more uh, oversight in uh, um, helping to maintain that existing system. So sometimes uh, um, homeowners can put debris in the ditches and they figure, well, it's just going to wash on down. Well, you do that debris and then uh, sort of plugs up Richard's culvert. Well, then he's expending quite a bit of effort to go in and through and clean it. So there are some uh, 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 steps a person or the county can take to help uh, clear steer, that kind of stuff. The uh, fifth chapter, that's where we'll go in and do the hydrological analysis um, based on the drainage basin, the slope characteristics. Um, some of the bigger pipes we anticipate having to go in and get the actual uh, slope of the pipe, confirm the diameter, because uh, that comes into play with determining is that pipe going to pass a 25-year storm. The chapter six, um, that's where we're evaluating the results of the hydrological analysis. Um, and if we show a pipe can't handle it, then we're going in and running models of what that pipe needs to be and coming up with alternatives. So maybe there's a way if you have a deep culvert, uh, it gets to be a real extensive cost to go in and replace it. Is there a way to reroute flows away from that culvert or a portion of those flows where you're thereby saving costs and not having to replace such a deep pipe? Um, so that's where you're, you're coming up with alternatives. And then uh, last chapter is the recommended plan. That's where you're going to go through, um, prioritize the projects that uh, came about with the uh, deficiencies we noted in the master plan and the uh, hydro hydrological analysis and then we'll go through and prioritize uh, those projects based on need um, so that uh, let's see the uh, stormwater maintenance plan that'll also be part of this uh, study uh, for maintaining the overall system and I think we'll also identify again those projects where Army Corps of Engineers and DSL, sometimes you get into the uh, established waterway, then you're also dealing with that type of permitting. So this is uh, a fairly large uh, um, study document just because of the uh, you're dealing with the overall county. Um, and as such, we're anticipating this type of study will take around a year to complete. Um, so that's the uh, uh, we show starting this, um, say, in March, depending on, uh, not March, but April of this year, it'd go through a sort of a winter cycle, so it wouldn't be complete till the following uh, April. Um, we would have uh, two to three meetings with uh, road department staff and other pertinent county personnel just to go over the projects, and there might be there's some ones that they want to prioritize over uh, some of the other ones. So. Any questions? All right, thanks, Michael. Any questions for Michael? Chris? I, I have a question from uh, Rich, if I could, okay. please. Um, is there any help from federal government on this? Because uh, I'm seeing the fees 291 and 119. 
For both projects, uh, for both. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, 294 and 119. Right. I, I looked into that to help for funding with through DSL, who helped with the last plan with the City of Brookings and the County for the Harbor Bench and the Port. And uh, I will look for that, but last year it was not available. But I'll reach out to DSL as well. I think, though, what you really got to look at is what I look at is, yeah, there's a big cost up front on this plan, but it, with one $500,000 grant, you paid for this plan. And there's potential for multiple grants in these plans. And these plans, you know, will keep chasing this money for years. You know, they, just because this plan ends in six years doesn't mean that we're going to stop doing that. And, and like I said, in five years, on this last plan, we're going to look at renewing that plan and updating it because different deficiencies have come to our attention or things have changed. And so I kind of look at it as a leveraging tool for it to get funding. And uh, so, yeah, there's a high upfront cost to this plan. The county's never had this plan. And, you know, this plan, there's going to be public input like we had in the last plan. And what was really nice, some of that public input we had in the last plan that we addressed uh, I had other customers call and say, hey, what about this? And I go, well, look at the plan. And actually, we had it covered. And I said, well, our master plan says we're going to do this. Our, this is what our plan is. And so it's something that we're, I'm not just going to get done and put it on a shelf and forget about it. It's something I'm going to be using every year for budgeting. It's going to be something that when customers call, I save a lot of that information that's given to me the last three years that I found a deficiency. I save all that stuff. I try to address it in these plans like we did in the road plan. And uh, so through these workshops and the community input, plus all the input from all the road uh, partners, the, the field crews, the engineering, you know, we put all our efforts into addressing every issue that we know and try to get them into these plans. Okay. Thanks. That's all I have. Any other questions? So this plan will help us when we go to get grants. We, we'll say, "Hey, we got this plan," and that that's that's a, a benefit, right? Yes, that's exactly right. And so when you apply for a grant, you know, uh, you know, why are you asking for this money? Well, we have this adopted plan by the board of commissioners, and it's it, it's an engineered plan yep. with real numbers. So that when you do your grant application, you're not trying to hire an engineer to come up with these numbers. You already have them. Yep. And, uh, and they're in an adopted plan that the board supports. Moves you to the head of the line is what it does. Yeah, it does. It raises your grant score. Okay. Absolutely. So we, we're city engineer for a lot of uh, cities throughout southwestern Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the, say, a lot of the major projects that we undertake for the cities, almost all of them have some type of planning document that outlined where that project has came from. So we've just we're processed of the city gold beach here. We've got a water project that's out for bid right now. It's about a million and a half dollar project. That came about of a water master plan to show the need for it. Uh, and that one, the city has funding, got funding from the state for that. So having those type of uh, I guess the planning document uh, goes a long ways towards securing that funding. So, all right, good. All right. Well, we're welcome done. back. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> well, I've got some good news when everybody's ready. Um, is it really the end? Yeah. If we don't have any more In questions. My honor. You planned it that way. Yeah. Right? Well, hey, good news is on uh, from the governor's program um, on the measurement that they use for risk level to the counties, yes, we're an extreme, but they, uh, her, her staff or whatever, decided that they're going to have a two-week grace period. So we just went into extreme. That means that there'd be no restrictions changed in the next three weeks. Um, so if we come down to, we come down to high or moderate, uh, we'll be in very good shape. A lot of discussion. A lot of discussion about high school sports, schools, um, and, uh, you know, it's it's not enough at all, but it's good news, and uh, we're just going to keep building on that, and um, I, I appreciate the dedication of this board, and also uh, one million of the 4.2 
million people in Oregon have been vaccinated. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, the average age of the death in Oregon um, is 78.9. They've just amended that uh, statistic. So basically 79 years old. There's more, but I think that's enough for today. Um, sorry I missed your, the last part there, but I'm going to go back and look at it on the video. Much appreciated, gentlemen. All right. Okay, just in closing, I plan to bring to you the next meeting uh, a task order and uh, move this forward. What I really need to do, I need to do a little more checking. As Mike said, we'd like to kick off this plan as soon as possible. So. I want to look for like forty to sixty thousand dollars in this year's budget that I could uh, start this plan now, not wait till July first. So I have some legwork to do, and be reaching out to you and uh, with a agenda routing slip here in the next week. Okay, thank you. Thanks, guys. You guys. Thank you all. Uh oh, you broke it. Late. Mr. Pash. Well, I'm just, I know we've got another thing on here, but we have to go back into executive session because we didn't do A, and that's going to take up quite a bit of time. And I, I, I told Director Rickard that I was going to postpone that, which is fine. And that is on, you're, you're talking about other workshop item, restaurant fee decreases or reductions? For a later meeting, yes. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, we're done here then. So we're going to leave workshop, adjourn that, and then go back into uh, regular session, then go to... Executive session, correct? I'm directly back into executive session. Unless you want to do that, that for a regular session, is that right? Do that. We still have to go back to regular session, but we can go from here directly back to executive. Okay. And or we can go. <laughs> however, you you're you're the chair, sir. <laughs> we you can do it how you we want to do it. So we we're leaving workshop again. The date is March third, two thousand twenty-one, and we're going to go out of uh, workshop into regular session. And uh, regular, or executive? regular, so we can now go back into executive. I thought we had to be at that stage, that step. So we're in, we are in executive session, and uh, we'll get ready here. Eric, if you're with us out there, hold on. And go to executive been... session, you got to change the tapes and everything. Yeah, so that's why we're, I just give them the time to do that. <laughs> Lovely mask, it goes with. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're leaving uh, executive session. We're going back into general session. Uh, we're going to ask staff to proceed as directed with the authorizing of the contractual agreement with Ironclad Company, uh, signature authority to Director Rickard. Anything else before the board? Yes. Mr. Pash? We have to finish number eight, nine, ten. Oh. I've got to turn the page here. Okay, so are we at director's report next then? Yes. So I have four items. First one is last meeting we had, uh, there was a higher order on the, on the agenda for Hillary Johnson in Rhodes Department. Um, she was talked about in, ex in executive session, but we did not come out and, and the commissioners did not um, approve the higher order. She has started in the Rhodes Department. Um, but if, I guess, what's the proper procedure here? If, if there's anyone who dissents, or do we need a vote? You, um, yeah. I make a motion that we approve the higher order for Rose Johnson. Second. No more discussion? Roll call, please, Staff Jesuit. Ah, we caught him off guard. <laughs> Commissioner Pash. Aye. Vice Chair Herzog. Yes. Chair Boyce. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Okay, next item is with, I'm let, just letting the board know that with all the recent resignations from the Housing Committee, um, we, I have noticed that we are accepting more applications. I, I think we do have a, a vacancy there, too, that we need to fill. Um, next item. But that is the one that we missed. Not roads. Community development, not roads. You'll go. just you'll just change the minutes, right, JJ? Good. Okay, just Henry change the minutes. Community development. Okay, last time I last meeting I had mentioned uh, Frank, our the individual we hired to do the COVID cleaning. 
a temporary employee, and he was supposed to be temporary until COVID funding ran out. I mentioned that COVID funding has run out, but we, but we really need to keep him till the end of the pandemic. Um, I, there were some other options thrown out, none of which will work at this point in time. But unless otherwise directed by the board, um, I suggest that we keep him here as as cleaning and sanitation of of, the, of our buildings. Okay. And then it was also talked about last meeting about the need for for some minute taking software and and different um, hardware. Um, I, Again, I am just informing the board that I am working on that a little bit more, working with Eric and Miranda on the needs, on the AV needs for um, the, the setup here and looking into um, the, the software and that that could provide dictation or minute taking or that. And I should have a proposal next meeting to go before the board. May I call, are you guys... You're not done, are you? I am done. Okay, real quick here then. Uh, we have about 40,000 in pig funds, correct? Um, I, I don't know the total that we have. Yeah, right I think, now. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. I think Council Huddle actually looked that up. I'm not sure. Maybe it was Miranda. Um, so I'm not oh, a peg. <laughs> huh? I, never mind, peg. Good. Peg funds, I, yes. I, I didn't um, and we know we're going to need to work back there. Yes. And so you're aware of that. Yes. And I uh, spent a little time with Miranda on that a couple months ago. And may not be that expensive, but that would be the focus, at least initially, in my opinion, of where we would need to spend some of that, some of those funds and some upgrades. I'm going to give Commissioner Huxley kudos again for the work that he did on this five years ago, or not quite that long. So, uh, yeah, I'll be anxious for that report. I, I want to be uh, helpful if I can be on that. I'm not real thrilled about having microphones on the counter. We're a little cramped for space here, but I'm not ruling that out either. Anything else? I had a question for Director. And How's, I mean, you can just say maybe later, but revise. I can't remember. There was some issue with that or something that's coming up for renewal or yeah. possibly our web. Maybe later. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, maybe later. Th sorry, everyone. Good. Thanks. Who's next? Me? Yes. Um, we're going to have a movie report at some point here, either with uh, Economic Development Director Ma Madison or maybe Miranda or both. Maybe even have James Crook come in from uh, the Crook Ranch. Um, that was a big, big movie, and we're pretty proud of the work that our citizens did, and it was a great boost to our economy. Uh, I have one thing here. This is a letter from John Schleining, who bought my lot several years ago, one of the finest people I've ever met in my life. It's a letter I would like to take the liberty of reading. I know we're winding down here, um, but it has to do with a... With a uh, uh, person that President Trump pardoned, and uh, it is, I think it will touch some hearts here. To Greg Walden, Representative Second District of Oregon, dear Greg, let me first thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you have done to help Southern and Eastern Oregon while in Congress. I truly hate to see you leave with all the internal and external struggles our country is facing. Your common sense approach and natural decency are really needed in Washington, D.C. now more than ever. Whatever you decide to do, Kathy and I both wish you the very best in your new life and hope to see you at Paradise Lodge on the Rogue someday. I'm writing you with a heavy heart, and I am asking you for help to get my letter and backup letters to President Trump as soon as possible. A very dear friend of ours and a longtime Oregonian, John Harder, is currently being held at the Satellite Federal Prison Camp in Sheridan, Oregon. My letter and backup letters, including from Federal Judge Michael Hogan and Oregon State Judge Lyle Delure, tells John's story. We are asking the President for commutation for John. John's story is both compelling and extremely sad. John was raised in Oregon, went to Walla Walla College, and started SunWest, the fourth largest assisted living and Alzheimer's care company in the country. John had over 13,000 employees in 38 states, making him one of the larger employers in Oregon. During the 2008 financial crash of commercial real estate, one of the company's lenders forced the company into bankruptcy that I believe was unnecessary. During the bankruptcy reorganization, the Honorable Federal Judge Michael Hogan, he's one of the greatest federal judges people you'd ever meet in your life. I've had the honor of being a friend with him. Came to John and asked him to give up his 70% of the companies worth over $1 billion to help the investors, and John did just that. 
some of the assets were told to the Blackstone's hedge fund and all of the investors that stayed in the deal with Blackstone got all of their money back, plus a profit during the worst commercial real estate collapse in our lifetime, thanks to John Harder. Later, the SEC came to Judge Hogan to ask him for a huge fine against John of $180 million. Judge Hogan refused to give them a cent because of how John cooperated fully in the process, did not litigate for his $1 billion of equity, and gave everything he owned to help the investors and friends. This really enraged the SEC, and four, four years later, after John had given everything he owned to help the investors, they indicted him. Now penniless, he went from a billionaire to needing a public defender. The case was too large for the public defender with hundreds of depositions and rooms full of documents for John to plead not guilty and to go to court. Eventually, a plea deal was reached whereby John pled guilty to one count of mail fraud and one count of money laundering and agreed that Judge Simon could impose a sentence from 5 to 15 years after a sentencing, sentencing hearing. At the time, the public defender thought that John had a good chance for five years because two judges and the creditor's attorney, that's the big one, agreed to testify, that's uh, Ford Lacer, agreed to testify for John asking for leniency because of what John had done to help the process and the investors. John answered all questions asked of him without legal counsel, thinking that he had done nothing wrong. John had the largest law firms in Portland, Oregon, create all of the disclosure documents and 13 in-house attorneys to review their work, and never once was John told the documents were inadequate or illegal. Oregon State Judge Lyle Velour, Federal Judge Hogan, and the creditor's attorney, key point, all testified at the sentencing hearing asking Judge Simon to take into consideration everything that John had done to help the process and the investors, that John was all in, and without his contributions, all of the investors would have been financially devastated. They all asked for clemency for John. Having a state judge, a federal judge, and your opponent, the creditor's attorney, coming to test for the testify for the defendant in a criminal case is unprecedented in the criminal justice system in the United States. Nevertheless, even after all their pleas for clemency, Judge Simon had already typed up 15 years in federal prison. Upon reading the sentence, John passed out on the floor. John's public defender, Christopher Schatz, resigned from the public defender's office and gave up his license to practice law in protest of what he called the draconian sentence imposed on John Harder by Judge Simon. John is again, uh, he's in prison. This is written in June, I'm sorry. This was written May 6th of 2020. John is in prison with robbers, drug dealers, carjackers, home invaders, gang members, cartel members, child abusers, but most of his fellow inmates received less years in prison than John. His sentence is excessive and a travesty of justice. Personally, John is a man of tremendous faith, has helped literally hundreds of people, both personally and financially, has never in his life had a drop of alcohol or taken an illegal drug. John is one of the most decent people that I have ever known. John is a great son to his elderly parents, a wonderful husband to his wife, Kristen, and a loving dad to his daughter, McClay. The general deterrent value of John's sentence has been fully realized, and what we're asking of President Trump is to commute John's sentence to five years. For a good person like John, five years in prison away from his family is an eternity. John is not a danger to anyone. Commuting his sentence will also have a positive social impact and it would encourage other businessmen and women who find themselves in legal trouble to consider full cooperation with authorities as John did, rather than stonewalling. He did the right thing. I would love to talk to you personally and then close to the people. I wrote a letter on that. I got a call from, um, from Mr. Harder. It's on my phone. I won't give that to you, but it... Um, it was just, uh, it, it was brought me to tears, and he was released on President Trump's last day of office. And um, he's back with his family. And uh, thank you for letting me take that time, board. That's, that's all I have. Who's next, please? I have nothing. I have just a couple things. First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see the on Harbor for, uh, for Roy, uh, Harbor for, uh, for Roy. Uh, I would I would urge everyone to go to that. I'm sure it's going to be some fun in that as well. But uh, I would just urge everyone to go to that and learn who Roy Davis was. He was he was a pretty good guy in the county. Like I said, he was a little out there, but we all loved him for that. So when is that, Commissioner Pash? Pardon? When is that? I'm not. I, oh, okay. I'm, I don't think they've it's come the up paper. with the date. It was in the newspaper uh, this week. Uh, I'm not sure if they have the date yet. I would just ask people to pay attention to it, and when it does come up, to join them in that. Uh, one other thing, I just want to alert the board. I know Commissioner or, or Chair Boyce had sent 
Um, Mr. Christensen, a email wondering about the uh, the fleet that the county currently has. Um, so he emailed me uh, as a liaison and let me know that um, he had um, done the inventory and that we are currently working through the fleet inventory uh, with the county and we will have some direction on that in coming weeks uh, because we are due to to reduce a few cars from the fleet and also there are some old kickers that we just need to maybe grind up and put in this in the steel yard. So couldn't agree more. Put them on Good the news. Pash bar, put them on the pasture. Uh, no. Pash don't <laughs> take down. That lot. That guy, he's kind of hard to get along with down there. He's got all them new ones now. He doesn't put them old ones there anymore. <laughs> Anything else, board? I don't like to just hit the gab without asking. Nope. We're good to go. See you all next Wednesday. Thank you.